Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our further facilitated business forum um, as we go down the road to recovery. And for those that know me and have joined these sessions previously, my name is Wes O'Donnell. I'm the National Workplace Relations Manager with HR Assured and FCB Group. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Um, we've got a really busy agenda today, actually, um, in that, as normal, lots have been happening in the industrial relations landscape, and I'm sure a lot of you have got questions that you'd like to have addressed. Um, for those that haven't joined us previously for these types of forums, um, the presentation is not the classic type of webinar structure where I speak to you for an hour on a various topic, but rather we like to probably speak or provide an update generally for around 30 to 40 minutes on matters which have occurred in the last two, three weeks, which we think is of um, relevance and topical to you and your business. Predominantly, we'll be leaving a lot of time for Q&A, so this is your opportunity to tap into um, you know, an advisor and an expert in the field to ask any questions that you may have. Um, obviously, with a large number of attendees, it's not possible, unfortunately, to get through all questions. So members of my team will be going through the questions um, as we go through the presentation to group them together to find common questions and pass them through. Hopefully, by that way, we'll be able to address as many topics in general as we possibly can that will be of relevance to the most or the greatest number of individuals. Um, but if I can't get to your questions, I do apologise. Um, but of course, myself and my team are always happy to assist if we can't get through any of the particular questions. So please raise the questions at any stage. Um, um, where I can, um, and it's relevant to the particular provision or section that I'm on, I'll try to address the question as we go through. Otherwise, as I said, I'll try to leave um, sufficient opportunity at the end of the session um, to address questions where possible. So um, we are wanting to discuss quite a bit today around um, the JobKeeper extension legislation, which has been very positively received by many of our clients and businesses that we engage and interact with. Um, firstly, I just wanted to have a bit of a chat around some economic statistics which were released yesterday, then go into a more um, in-depth discussion around JobKeeper 2.0, and then briefly discuss the nature and effect of both the recent Mondelez decision of the High Court, as well as the full bench of the, Fed, of the Fair Work Commission's decision in relation to casual overtime provisions. As I mentioned, a lot of time will be left to address any particular questions that you may have. <coughs> Apologies. Um, as I'm sure everyone has realised and read um, through the media yesterday, um, the um, June quarter st economic statistics were released yesterday indicating that there was a contraction in, in GDP growth of 7% in the June quarter. Um, the um, contraction is the second successive quarter of negative economic growth, and as such, that um, means that we are technically in a recession which was widely anticipated and, and, and um, assumed in any event. When we look at the contraction in GDP in the March quarter, there was a 0.3% contraction, which isn't large, but in the context of a very limited period of time of significant impact, that, 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 that means that the contraction of that level um, ha, ha, is quite significant. When we come into the June quarter, a, a negative 7% of growth is significant, but in many of the financial press yesterday and today have indicated that it is as expected or perhaps slightly lower than expected. Um, I don't want to get into economic forecast or, or anticipated um, bounce backs or best case scenarios or worst case scenarios of next year. Um, but if anyone is interested, I'd really encourage you to read some of the literature of the Treasury as well as the Reserve Bank, which does provide some forecast in relation to economic growth um, returning in 2021. I thought I'd temper that, though, um, with some figures around employment. Um, obviously, the fact that the economy is in recession isn't a surprise, but it will be an unusual circumstance for many, given that the Australian economy hasn't been in recession since the early 1990s. 
who have had 30 years of positive economic growth in the Australian economy, which is perhaps um, often quoted as the best amongst OECD countries. Um, so in that sense, many of the business proprietors or indeed employees um, that we're engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis have never encountered or experienced a downturn of this magnitude or at all. Um, but when we look at the economic figures around employment, um, there's some positives in my view to be taken from that. Um, when we look at the July employment figures, we saw that there was employment growth with an extra 115,000 roles created in July, 45,000 of which were um, permanent full-time roles, which is really positive. And although there was an increase in the unemployment rate by 0.1% to 7.5%, that is viewed by many as not necessarily a bad outcome given that the participation rate in that corresponding period increased by 0.6%. So that is, there is 0.6% more people coming into the labour market actively looking for work. However, unemployment only increased by 0.1%, so not a larger margin. Um, so, so there's some positives to take from that. And I think that um, the fact that we're in recession means that there's some certain things that we need to be conscious of and aware of but we'll certainly go through all of those through this discussion. The predominant nature of the, the talk I, I wanted to speak about was JobKeeper 2.0, as many people are referring to it and indeed the government are referring to it as. Um, and I wanted to spend a bit of time with this given that the, um, the legislation only passed through Parliament on the 1st of September. So there is some detail which people are still working through and to a certain extent an anticipated or, or expected rather level of um, uncertainty where people are working through that. I'll try to break it down in terms of um, what I think to be most relevant for business um, operators but of course um, it, it's never possible in a session like this to exhaust um, all of the information that you'd need to know. So I'll try as best I can to give you the level of information which I think is necessary and relevant. As mentioned, the JobKeeper scheme was extended through Parliament, uh, passed through Parliament <clears throat> rather on the 1st of September. Yeah? The effect of that was to effectively increase the operating period of the JobKeeper scheme until 28th of March next year, so a further six month period. That's been really positively, um, um, in my view anyway, um, received by business proprietors, employees and the public at large, given that it's avoided the anticipated fiscal cliff, as many commentators refer to it as, that would have arisen from the withdrawal of the JobKeeper scheme on the 28th of September. What this has effectively done is to push the effective operating period out to allow both in, um, impacted businesses, which remain impacted, and their employees a greater period of time to trade through the current environment and potentially prepare for coming out of the JobKeeper scheme in the 28th of March next year. Broadly speaking, the legislation creates two categories of business. The first category are what we call qualifying employers, which are businesses which qualify or are eligible for JobKeeper payments after the 28th of September. And what we call legacy employers, which did receive JobKeeper payments under JobKeeper 1.0, but are no longer eligible for or qualify for payments in JobKeeper 2.0. And we'll go through um, what impact or na the nature and effect of both groups have. So the first one we look at is qualifying employers. So these are employers where they are eligible and remain eligible for, for um, um, participation under JobKeeper 2.0. These employers are eligible to continue to receive payments, albeit in a reduced or amended fashion, up to 28th of March 2021 subject to qualification requirements. Any qualifying employer can continue to issue JobKeeper enabled directions in, to employees subject to 
um, ongoing consultation provisions. <clears throat> However, the existing flexibilities within the Fair Work Act around annual leave um, will be repealed and will not extend beyond the 28th of September. So what does that mean? In effect, it means that if a business remains eligible or is eligible, if you're a new business coming into the scheme, you can continue to utilise the flexibility provisions under the Fair Work Act to issue JobKeeper enabled directions. Um, however, what it means is that you're unable to request an employee to use accrued annual leave or take leave at um, half, um, double the leave at half the pay as you have previously been entitled to. Now, there's two points that come from that. The, the first is that although the flexibility around the annual leave provisions have been removed, it, it doesn't enable, it doesn't reduce or stop rather, um, an employer and employee having discussions as to when um, leave should be taken, how leave should be taken, etc. As long as there is a genuine mutual agreement between the parties, um, there is nothing wrong with having such a discussion. And we've found generally throughout the course of the year that where employees are presented with options um, which are designed to preserve their employment on a long-term long basis, they are generally receptive to having those conversations and are generally flexible and accommodating in any of those type of arrangements. So even though the, the, the flexibility provisions have been formally removed, we'd probably still encourage you to continue having those discussions with employees if you think it's necessary, appropriate and would assist your business. The other thing to note is that where an a business has already issued a direction um, concerning the annual leave provisions which would have extended beyond the 28th of September, um, they will need to be revised. Yeah? So something to really consider there. Um, we then look at legacy employers. And we'll discuss qualification in a moment. But the second broad group are those businesses who were entitled to receive um, JobKeeper payments for an employee under JobKeeper 1.0 however, have not qualified for the new scheme given eligibility conditions, but continue to receive or experience rather a reduction in turnover of at least 10%. Now, businesses can self-certify or can effectively um, have a certificate issued by a financial services provider to that effect, which means that they would be deemed a legacy employer. The the benefit of that is that whilst a business is not eligible to receive the wage subsidy um, 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 which would otherwise be payable to anyone which is a eligible JobKeeper business, they can continue to utilise some of the efficiency provisions or flexibility provisions which exist under the Act. In particular, um, um, legacy employers um, can continue to provide a JobKeeper enabling direction in relation to duties or locations of work, and in particular can provide a, a JobKeeper enabling stand down direction so long as the employee's hours are not reduced to less than 60% of their original hours of work as at the 1st of March 2020 and an employee is not required to work less than two consecutive hours in a day. Yeah. There are ongoing consultation provisions which need to be complied with, obviously, but I think this is a really um, important provision under the legislation because I, I personally anticipate that there will be a cohort of businesses which remain impacted by the current pandemic but not to the extent of the necessary 30% required to remain eligible for JobKeeper 2.0 and to receive the wage subsidy. So for those that can remain eligible and have a reduction in their turnover of at least 10%, this enables business to provide a JobKeeper enabled direction to reduce days and hours of work to a level 
which may more accurately reflect demand within the business, or to a level which would enable them to manage um, their labour cost base at a more acceptable position, noting of course that they're coming from a position of ex um, receiving wage subsidies to none. So it's really important that, that we can consider that and start to plan for it, which we'll discuss in a moment. So we've got the qualifying employers, we've got the legacy employers, and as mentioned, those qualifying employers need to satisfy ongoing eligibility. Under the, the legislation, for, to be eligible for JobKeeper 2.0, you must continue to satisfy a turnover test. Now, there is a slight difference between the initial government announcement. The initial government announcement in early August, I believe, from memory, suggested that to qualify for the next three month period between the 28th of September and the 3rd of January, a business needed to satisfy the reduction in turnover of both the June and um, September quarter in order to qualify. That's now been relaxed and businesses are only required to satisfy the turnover test for the September quarter. So again, to satisfy for JobKeeper 2.0 in the period of 28 September to 3rd of January, you must satisfy that there is the requisite reduction in your turnover in the September 2020 quarter um, um, in relation to a comparable period in 2019. Yeah? Um, as per normal, the required reduction in turnover is either 30% or more for businesses with aggregated turnover of less than 1 billion. 50% or more for businesses with aggregated turnover of 1 billion or more, um, or 15% or more for registered charities and non-profit organisations. Um, you can then see that in order to satisfy for the second tranche or the second quarter of JobKeeper 2.0, being the period of 4 January to 28 March 2021, Businesses must also satisfy the eligibility criteria and the reduction in turnover for the December 2020 quarter. So really significant change, yeah? and that change is significant given that the current existing scheme under JobKeeper 1.0 was that you applied and qualified once and you were in the scheme for the duration of the six month period. What the revised JobKeeper 2.0 scheme does is it effectively ensures that those businesses most impacted by COVID on an ongoing basis continue to receive support where needed, but where they are in an industry or a business which has or will improve, then they will no longer be eligible for that support. Some key considerations um, arise from this. And again, this is an area where um, I can't traverse all of the legislation or guidance notes, but um, um, key considerations that I think people should be across or at least aware of. Um, so as I said, businesses will need to requalify for JobKeeper 2.0. The reduction in turnover will be assessed against a comparable period in 2019. So that's the September quarter and the December quarter. However, as has already been the case, there exists the, ability, exists the ability to apply to the Commissioner of Taxation, um, given that the ATO manages this scheme, um, to um, apply for an exemption. Um, so where businesses um, believe that the, the periods are not comparable, um, then there is the ability to, to seek an exemption and I would really encourage businesses to do that. And that may be because effectively the, um, the periods, between the two periods, um, there was part of the business which was acquired or sold for sole traders or partnerships. There was a significant period of absence from their proprietor or partner. Um, there was, you know, um, um, you know, um, you know um, natural disasters which impacted um, um, business um, success in those particular periods, etc. So, so just look at it and start to plan that. The other thing is that businesses can be new businesses into JobKeeper 2.0. There is not a precondition that you have received or, or eligible to receive payments under JobKeeper 1.0. Yep. Um, turnover is calculated as it is for GST, which includes all taxable and GST-free supplies but it excludes input tax supplies 
and foreign based turnover conditions. The other thing to, to really consider as well is that um, businesses will need to assess eligibility in advance of the BAS deadline. So uh, unfortunately the timing doesn't work neatly because effectively the um, BAS statement for the September quarter is not due until late October and the BAS statement for the December quarter is not due until late January but you know, if those dates already exceed the period of time where you've had to apply and be tested as eligible. So you will need to assess eligibility well in advance of that BAS deadline. So a, a couple of practical tips um, um, come from that and I'll explain them um, in deeper a little bit later but um, a couple of things which we might want to consider. Firstly, um, businesses should be, in, in my view, considering their ongoing eligibility under JobKeeper 2.0. Um, that eligibility should be assessed and most businesses I would respectfully suggest have a pretty good idea as to whether they would be eligible under JobKeeper 2.0 or not. Where a business is eligible, um, consideration should be given um, as to cash flow. Yeah. We'll discuss the reduced rates of pay in a moment, but um, given that the amount of wage subsidy will decrease, businesses should consider in advance whether that presents any particular cash flow difficulties and whether they need to meet those cash flow difficulties by issuing a revised JobKeeper enabled direction to reduce by a corresponding amount the days and hours worked by an individual. Planning really also needs to be given um, where a business is unlikely to be uh, eligible and therefore consideration should be given as to whether they can apply for an exemption or where they will not be eligible, what they need to do, if anything, from a business continuity perspective. And what I mean by that is that where a business is no longer eligible and coming out of the wage subsidy scheme, which would have greatly assisted that business over the previous six months, um, is their business able to operate um, um, outside of that scheme? Do you need to consider alterations to working arrangements to reduce days and hours of work to either meet demand or reduced costs to a position which is acceptable? And how do you achieve that? So do you achieve that either by having open, transparent discussions with employees to reach agreement upon a temporary, mutually agreed variation to their days and hours of work? Or in the absence of that, do we need to consider um, more um, structured and considered approaches including redundancies. So there's a lot to consider. JobKeeper 2.0 is really favourable and beneficial but there is really a lot to consider before the 28th of Mar uh, February sorry, so that we can really prepare our business, you know, prepare for the, the cost implication, you know, the reduction in wage subsidies um, and you know, whether we need to or not um, address that by way of alteration to people's days, hours of work to meet that. So having considered the business eligibility, I now wanted to, to go through and then discuss the employee eligibility. Um, and, and as I read it, there's probably three broad categories. That is employees who remain eligible on an ongoing basis. Yeah? Um, also, those who have been terminated um, but now um, um, have been re-employed and are eligible, <clears throat> or newly eligible employees that were not previously eligible at all. I'll go through each of those three categories in a moment, <clears throat> but probably the first thing I wanted to outline is that there is a revised structure in relation to the volume or quantum of JobKeeper payments to be made. 
Um, part of the, the, the reasoning of this is that there was you know, some criticism or commentary that employees received an increased benefit through JobKeeper 1.0 and effectively received a, a level of remuneration greater than their rate of pay salary than they previously enjoyed. Um, so there's, uh, in my reading, my, my view is that there's partly a reason to pull that back, um, but also a, a, an effort to try to wean people off the JobKeeper structure. So the government um, um, has approached it by um, um, effectively um, having two separate tranches. Um, the tranches are um, the, the first of the 28th of September to the 3rd of January, and then the 4th of January on. And consider two different groups. The first group is for you know the, 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 those employees that work more than 20 hours um, per fortnight. Um, and that is determined on the four week period before the 1st of March, or for newly eligible employees um, um, the 1st of July 2020. For those employees, the initial JobKeeper payment will reduce from $1,500 per fortnight to $1,200 per fortnight in the first period, and then will contract and reduce even further to $1,000 from the 4th of January. For employees who work less than 20 hours per fortnight, um, which again is assessed over a four week period before the 1st of March or the 1st of July, that rate will decrease from 1500 to 750 and then from the 4th of January reduced down to 650. So, so, so this I think also highlights the point previously raised that businesses do need to start planning um, from a cash flow perspective to start considering that employees are now working at a level, typically, which may be met by the wage subsidy received. But where that wage subsidy reduces, businesses may need to either plan and accept that there will be a requirement to effectively top up or pay wages for any other amount, or whether there is the possibility, or requirement rather, to effectively issue a revised JobKeeper enabled direction to bring people's days and hours of work back down to a level um, which is um, um, matching the, the wage subsidy received. If that is the case, and businesses do need to do that. The only qualification I would make is that businesses must comply with their obligations to consult regarding any variation to a JobKeeper enabled direction. Um, and that consultation process does require confirmation in writing. Yeah. More than happy to go through that with any particular business if needed. Just wanting to quickly go through um, the three categories of employees just really, really quickly. Um, the first is that those employees which remain eligible on an ongoing basis. And this uh, is, they were employed on or before the 1st of March 2020. They were in, uh, currently employed or, and that includes persons which are stood down or re-employed. Um, they are either permanent employees or long-term casuals. And a long-term casual, as we know, is defined as a regular and systematic um, um, casual, a casual who has been working on a regular and systematic basis for at least 12 months before the 1st of March. Um, they are either 18 years of age as of the 1st of March 2020, or in certain circumstances, junior employees. Um, they are Australian citizen, permanent resident, or a holder of a limited visa category. Um, they are resident for tax purposes as of the 1st of March, and they are not in receipt of JobKeeper payments from, from anyone else. The second category um, of employees are those which are re-employed. Yeah? And these are employees which have qualified for JobKeeper as at 1st of March 2020, for some reason ceased their employment with that employer between the 1st of March 2020 and the 1st of July 2020, and re were re-employed by that same employer after the 1st of July 2020 
and continues to satisfy the eligibility, other eligibility criteria um, as of the 1st of March and not have received at any point nominated JobKeeper payments from any other employer. Um, this is a really interesting group and I think a really sensible one where um, the, the entire purpose of JobKeeper initially was to keep employees close to a business to enable businesses to ramp up um, um, when able to. And, and this is um, a, a really important point because some businesses um, were unfortunately required to, to, to lay some people off and then brought them back in. And this enables those employees um, to continue um, to be eligible for the subsidy where they're employed by a business which remains impacted to a significant, significant extent. The next category are employees who are newly eligible. Yeah? Um, and, and this is again a, a really interesting category. Um, so the government is acknowledging that um, um, there have been movement amongst employees and new employees coming into a business since the 1st of March and therefore they should be brought into the scheme um, um, where an employer continues to be impacted significantly by COVID and the pandemic. So newly eligible employees are those which are employed by the employer on or before the 1st of July. Yeah. So effectively employed between the 1st of March and the 1st of July. Now currently employed by an eligible employer, including you know, employees that happen to be unfortunately stood down. They are permanent or long-term casuals, but in this context, a long-term casual is defined as someone who has been employed on a regular and systematic basis for 12 months as at the 1st of July, not the 1st of March, so there's a movement there. Um, again, 18 or eligible junior employee, Australian citizen, permanent resident, holder of a limited visa category. Um, there is a condition here that employees not in any JobKeeper period receive paid government parental leave, dad and partner pay or workers comp for a permanent um, disability and not in receipt of JobKeeper payments from another employer. So, so a really important category of, of people. Um, so before we move on to the Mondelez decision and, and as I said, I'm hoping to, to, to conclude this in about 10 minutes time to allow sufficient opportunity for questions. Um, some really great announcements um, that the government, in, in my opinion, has made with regards to JobKeeper 2.0. I, I think it draws a, a balance between wanting to avoid the fiscal cliff and continuing to provide monetary and operational support for businesses which are impacted significantly by COVID and also provides a level of operational support, or be it not financial support, um, to those businesses which are impacted or continue to be impacted, albeit not to the same extent um, of eligible employees. So again, with the JobKeeper, really strongly encourage all businesses to start that planning process now. You have until the 28th of September to assess and be deemed eligible. Businesses really need to start that process to consider um, whether there are any structural amendments which need to be made to their business um, to take into account the reduced subsidies which will be experienced or received over time. Businesses also need to consider where that is the case, um, whether they need to consult and issue employees with a revised JobKeeper enabled direction, or alternatively, where they come out of the scheme. In my opinion, it's best practice to inform employees that the employer is no longer eligible and that employees will return to their standard days, contracted hours of work, et cetera, unless other arrangements have already come into effect. That being said, um, and we've got a lot of questions on JobKeeper, so I'm sure that um, um, we'll be talking about it in a moment, but I just wanted to touch quickly upon two decisions. Um, the first is the Mondelez decision and then the casual overtime decision. Um, many businesses um, <clears throat> have been um, 
um, anticip eagerly anticipating the High Court's decision in the Mondelez matter. Um, <clears throat> many employers um, will know that in late 2019, the full bench of the federal court effectively determined that when considering what constitutes a day of personal carer's leave, in essence, it determined that a day is a day. Yeah, uneloquent way of saying it, but that's probably the easiest way of describing it. And, and what triggered that particular case was that an employee um, was working irregular shift patterns and on a particular day would have worked, as an example, 10 hours on that day, albeit the employer only paid 7.6 hours personal carer's leave whenever the employee took personal carer's leave on that day. The employee union in question and the full bench of the federal court took the view that a day is a day and an employee should be compensated for what they otherwise would have worked on that day. The implication of that decision though was in effect that employees working irregular shift patterns could potentially um, have access to a far greater personal carer's leave entitlement than was um, anticipated or contemplated. You know, an example is a um, full-time employee working 38 hours per week entitled to 10 days leave per year, two weeks, that's 38 times two equals 72. Um, 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 however, if we take that example of an employee who um, has taken leave on a day where he or she worked 10 hours, that is 10 um, times 10 is 100. So there is an entitlement to 100 hours of personal carer's leave as opposed to the 72. So the matter was appealed to the High Court. On the 13th of August, the High Court handed down its much anticipated decision and effectively determined that effectively um, personal carer's leave should be calculated um, um, against an employee's or based upon an employee's ordinary hours of work, not days. Yep. In its decision, it said that a day is a reference to a notional day consisting of one-tenth of an employee's ordinary hours of work in a two-week period. However, it also noted that because patterns of work do not follow um, even fortnightly cycles, that 10 days personal carer's leave could also be calculated as 1 26th of, a ordinary hours of, of an employee's ordinary hours of work. So again, flips the full court decision on its head um, and many are commentating saying it's a common sense approach to the situation. So I, I think that many businesses um, change their accrual processes in light of the full bench decision, uh, sorry, the full bench of the um, federal court decision. Um, if, if that was your business, um, we'd encourage you to reach out and, and discuss your accrual process to date. Um, for those businesses that are across it, fantastic. Um, but if there's any further assistance that anyone needs, please reach out and let us know. But a really important decision in relation to that. The last one that I briefly want to touch upon um, um, and we'll, um, can't really do it much justice because of the size of the decision and I want to leave a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, but I just wanted to raise this really important decision um, which was issued by the full bench of the Fair Work Commission on the 18th of August, which I'll loosely call the casual overtime decision. Um, it was a common issue under the award review process. Um, broadly speaking, that full bench was convened to determine issues around um, apparent or possible ambiguity in approximately 93 modern awards where it was unclear whether an employee had an entitlement to overtime or alternatively it was unclear um, as to how um, an employee's overtime entitlement was calculated. Yeah. Um, so obviously given that approximately 93 modern awards formed part of that decision, 
Um, I'm not able to obviously speak to each of those awards with clarity, um, so I, I won't try. Um, having said that, um, there are a number of um, common um, industries and professions which people I know um, join these sessions, so I'll try to at least touch upon those particular matters. Um, the first one is for those in aged care. Um, the decision of the full bench of the Fair Work Commission determined that effectively casual overtime is actually calculated on the casually loaded rate. So that's an important decision, you know, it confirms that casuals are entitled to, to overtime and confirms that effectively the penalty is applied um, to the casually loaded rate. The Fitness Industry Award um, has determined that um, their casuals will be entitled to overtime moving forward and has addressed and corrected any ambiguity in that respect, but stated that over penalties do not include the casual loading because depending upon when a casual performs work, the loading varies and therefore the Commission said it would not be sensible or logical that effectively that would be the case and penalties apply on the loaded rate. The Health Professionals and Support Services Award has been determined that the casual overtime rate is calculated upon the loaded rate. And just briefly, the last slide that I wanted to get to is that there <coughs> excuse me, has been broad consensus um, that the casual loading um, um, and overtime penalty are added separately which is generally referred to as the cumulative approach in the following awards. So Animal Care and Veterinary Award, <clears throat> Banking, Finance and Insurance Award, Building and Construction General On-Site Award, Children's Services Award, Clark's Private, Fast Food, General, Hair and Beauty, Real Estate, Storage Services. Um, please note that that is not an exhaustive list of um, 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 modern awards within category two where there was a consensus position, um, nor uh, is, was the previous slide intended to be an exhaustive list of all of the 93 modern awards which were addressed under this um, pretty comprehensive decision. So if you do um, have any particular employees, um, um, casual employees, and have any uncertainty, we would invite you to reach out for our HR Assured clients, we have already issued um, um, alerts and updated pay tables which are uploaded to your HRA cloud website. Um, so please make use of that or call through to our telephone advisory service if we can be of any particular assistance. So with 15 minutes to go, as mentioned, we're gonna leave a lot of time to address your particular questions. So um, let's go through. As mentioned, I'll try to address as many as I can. Uh, and we'll go from there. Um, so the first question is, there is a new classification whereby part-time in part-timers need to be paid for a minimum 20 hours a week to claim the full JobKeeper amount, otherwise it's reduced. What date do they need to be paid 20 hours from? If their hours increase in September, is there a way to claim the full JobKeeper? Yep, really good question, um, but I, I think the government has um, anticipated this. I'll just flick back to the previous slide, sorry to jump around. You can see down the bottom it then says, I put, put it there, that the average hours of work will be determined upon the average hours worked in the four week period before the 1st of March 2020 or the 1st of July 2020 for newly eligible employees only. So in short, if it is an ongoing or re-employed eligible employee, an employee needs to work 20 hours or more in the four week period before the 1st of March 2020 to receive the full entitlement. In your question, it would be irrelevant 
if their hours increased in September. If it is a new, um, newly eligible employee, the respective period is the four weeks prior to the 1st of July 2020. So, next question. Um, sorry, just lost my my place. I'm sorry. Just bear with me for two seconds. Um, next question is: With JobKeeper 2.0 being reliant on turnover for the September quarter, which naturally can't be assessed until that quarter ends. What is the suggestion for the time we are in limbo between coming off one point? 1.0 and getting approval certification for 2.0. Do those currently on a direction cease on 27 September and then we need to absorb the cost of returning to regular contracts? Or is there leeway in continuing directions if we believe we are eligible? Good question. Um, the eligibility requirement and the assessment should occur, as I understand it from the ATO, before the 28th of September. Um, and therefore, businesses should know that effectively they are and remain eligible or not. Yeah? Technically speaking, if an employer is not eligible, then the JobKeeper-enabled direction ceases to apply on the 28th of September, except where you are a legacy employer where you are no longer eligible but meet the requisite minimum 10% reduction in turnover, in which case you can provide an alternative JobKeeper enabled direction after consultation which has the effect of reducing an employee's days or hours of work not more than 60% of its normal level. So I hope that answers your question and probably points to the requirement to start planning as I've discussed previously because in my view if there is any gap between coming out of JobKeeper and revising directions etc that's a potential area of issue and contention and technically a person's you know, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, ordinary hours of work will resume. So really important that people start planning for that, consulting with employees, um, issuing revised correspondence, noting conversations in writing as well. Um, and we've only got, you know, in effect, three weeks until that new structure come in, comes into place. And depending upon the size and complexity and, you know, geographically dispersed nature of your business, that's not a lot of time to, to undertake a pretty um, um, meaningful consultation process. So good question. Um, next question is with employer eligibility for JobKeeper 2.0 based on a 30% reduction, um, can you compare either of June or September with the same quarters as last year? Um, the June quarter is not relevant, but the September quarter is. So the legislation talks about um, the turnover test being satisfied against a comparable period in 2019. So that is the September quarter 2020 compared to the September tw quarter 2019. Um, as I said, however, there is the ability to apply for an exemption. Um, there is some great guidance notes issued by the Treasury and the ATO about um, varying um, um, tests which may apply or they could apply, um, it, it's too comprehensive to, to go in in this particular forum. Um, uh, it doesn't really meet our objectives, but I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Um, if you think as well that um, um, the September 2019 period is not a comparable period for whatever reason, I'd encourage you also to start speaking with your financial advisor, accountant, and all the ATO directly in relation to that sooner rather than later so that you can explore alternative options in the process for seeking an exemption. Um, I would really encourage businesses to explore the options of an exemption 
um, and other special circumstances rather than just conceding or considering that you're not eligible for JobKeeper 2.0. Um, the um, next question is, can employers change the ordinary hours of work under this flexibility, particularly to change the days of work? So from Monday to Friday, but now is being asked to Saturdays. Um, um, no, you can't direct someone, but you can request. Um, the current flexibility arrangements under the JobKeeper scheme enable you to reduce someone's existing days and hours of work. Um, and you can request someone to vary their days and hours of work um, and an employee cannot unreasonably refuse. But that refusal um, does need to take into account um, their personal circumstances, etc. And an employee can make an application to the Fair Work Commission um, in the event, or either party can, in the event that they dispute it. Um, so to your question, the ongoing flexibility arrangements would enable you to reduce um, someone's days and hours of work um, you know, as an example, Monday to Friday, you can reduce them um, by a corresponding amount or make them work Monday to Wednesday only, as an example. But in my view, I don't think you can ask them to work, as an example, Tuesday to Saturday unless you're satisfied um, that there is no um, um, legitimate basis upon their refusal. Um, what is the situation where you don't meet the test for JobKeeper 2.0 overall, but you have some locations that are still severely affected? How do you effectively reduce hours or days of work? Yeah, really good question. Um, um, and this highlights at some, some, to some extent the complexity um, which national employers face. Um, ultimately, it depends on the reason why some businesses or locations are still severely impacted. Um, if it is merely a downturn in consumer demand, etc., then ultimately I think it's a commercial decision that the business will need to address and consider whether you continue to trade or not. And where you decide not to trade or reduce your operations, you can consider arrangements such as redundancies, you can consider um, mutual arrangements which need to be agreed with employees to vary days and hours of work by mutual consent, etc. I don't want to get into it because it is a bit of a complex um, um, discussion and there needs to be a, a, an in-depth assessment on a case-by-case -case basis and therefore I'm very reluctant to make general comments in a forum such as this. But um, where the reason um, for um, um, particular locations not operating as well is due to circumstances beyond your control, such as prevented from trading in Victoria, as an example, um, due to the impact of government regulations and restrictions. It may, and I say may, um, be possible for businesses to um, look at a Section 524 stand down where um, employees cannot be usefully engaged due to circumstances beyond the employer's control. Again, it's a possibility, needs to be explored on a much deeper basis, but there are some options available to you there and I'd um, um, respectfully suggest that you go through that initial planning stage but engage um, with your um, professional advisor, solicitor, accountant, um, us, whoever that may be, to help you through that planning phase. Next question are, is rather, um, are casuals who join too late for JobKeeper 1.0 now eligible for JobKeeper 2.0? Um, yes, in short they are. They're um, the newly eligible employees, conditional upon them meeting the necessary qualification criteria. Um, which includes that um, they are considered to be a regular and systematic um, casual for at least 12 months as at the 1st of July 2020. <clears throat> um, the next question is, are award-free employees um, now to have loading applied to the casual rate for any overtime. 
Um, no. Um, the, if you're referring to the casual decision of the full bench of the Fair Work Commission, um, that decision specifically related to um, approximately 93 modern awards and the Fair Work Commission has issued a decision concerning a variation or, or, or qualification or confirmation of those particular decisions. It did not impact um, any award-free employee, so the same position remains the same. Lots of more JobKeeper questions. Sorry, just trying to group them together to, to make the best use of the last five minutes. Um, So the next question, which is really relevant, so we'll spend a bit of time on this, um, I think probably the last question really, um, is can I confirm that if our company no longer qualifies for JobKeeper that we need to return our employees to their pre-COVID hours from October? Um, yeah, really good question and I'll assume that this question means that you are not a legacy employer also, which means that you are not impacted by 10% or more. Um, short answer is yes. Um, um, an employee has rights to work of a certain nature or volume arising from their contract of employment. The JobKeeper legislation amended the Fair Work Act to enable eligible businesses to issue a JobKeeper enabled direction to reduce the days or hours of work. And that's really significant. So, so what that did is it enabled an employer to issue a direction to reduce someone's contracted hours of work where they otherwise would not be able to do that without the express prior consent of their employee. So if you are no longer eligible to participate in the JobKeeper scheme, you effectively come out of that framework from the 28th of September. Okay? What that effectively means is that an employee's standard ordinary hours of work, contracted hours of work, etc., will resume. That's not to say, however, that an employer and an employee cannot reach an agreement around a temporary mutual variation to their hours of work. And as I said, um, I've been really heartened through this year where both employers and employees have come together um, in, in a really good spirit to mutually vary their terms, conditions, entitlements on a temporary basis with a view to retaining that employee on a long term. Yeah? So although you come out of the framework and although you, um, an employee's entitlements resume, there's nothing wrong with you having a open and transparent conversation with your employee concerning a variation to their hours, days, contracted entitlements. There are many, 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 many variations in what that looks like and that can be a period of unpaid leave, can be a period of reduced hours, it can be a reduced pay for a certain period, it can be permanent subject to someone's agreement or on a temporary basis subject to review. So again, this gets to the point that businesses really now need to start planning for that because you've got three weeks to consider which employees will be coming out of the JobKeeper scheme. Also the impact on your cost base because you've been experiencing a significant wage subsidy for the last six months and whether there is a need either from an operational or cash flow perspective to seek mutual variations to someone's entitlements and, and, and obligations or whether in the absence of that mutual agreement there is a need to um, undertake a more formal process. Not nice um, in any respect but certainly um, it, it shows that successful businesses are businesses that are planning well in advance and having, in my view, meaningful ongoing conversations with their employees to ensure that there is a agreed mutual position taken forward. So 
that being said, we've um, again come to um, uh, over time as per usual. Um, I really thank all of you for joining us again. Um, please pay attention to our standard alerts and communications where we will advertise the next session when we believe that there is sufficient change to justify bringing everyone together again. Um, for those clients of HR Assured, please feel free to ring through to my team at any stage if we can support you in any changes you're facing or any questions that you may have. Um, or for those of you that aren't HR Assured question, a client rather, that have a question or would just simply like to have more information around what we do and how we support businesses, by all means please don't hesitate to give myself or one of my colleagues a call on the details on the screen. So best of luck in um, um, planning your business and addressing the changes that will come with JobKeeper 2.0. I hope everyone remains safe and um, please don't hesitate to contact me or one of my colleagues if we can be of further assistance. Thank you.